Well, we've got a few people here. We've probably got one or two more to join, but um, let's get into um, into today's sessions. My video keeps on freezing, so I'm probably going to get tired of restarting and just leave me frozen at some stage. Um, but I will hand over to to Stuart soon, and and he'll introduce the the concept of Hortigodji to us. And uh, we ha we we have had a little bit of a discussion around how to pronounce it. Uh, uh, during our session, Stuart. So that's been one of the <laughs> interesting things we've kind of discussed. <laughs> How do you pronounce Hurigoji, Hurigoji? Well, I mean, I was raised in the back streets of Nottingham in England, so uh, in the slums, so I, I, I say Hurigoji. But um, a, a linguist told Chris and I once that it should be Hutagogi. And yeah, somehow, well, that's, that's kind of how I've, to, um, uh, I've pronounced it, but I've always not been quite sure, but anyway. Yeah, well, you were you were right. Um, you obviously went to a better school than I did. Um, yeah, who 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 to goggy? But I don't, I kind of can't take to who to goggy, so I don't know who to. <laughs> so, but who cares? Um, yeah. mo mostly we. I I I talk about self determined learning, and and more these days about learner agency. But that's yeah, just shifting focus a little bit. But self determined learning seems to be a lot better because people people kind of can't get their gills around who to goggy. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's um, pretty much a new concept to most people, but uh, the uh, facilitating online learning class, I suppose, I don't like, like calling it a class, but they are community of inquiry, community practice. Um, I think people have been very interested in the concept because uh, I think people are starting to see the relevance of it or you know, some of the possibilities around applying it to their own practice in some ways. Well, um, I hope so. it's, only, it's only taken 20 years, so I'm kind of hoping that that's happening. <laughs> so it's getting some traction out there, yeah. I'll be dead before I'm famous. Yes. Mm. Um, so maybe if you just want to flick off your screen sharing for the moment, Stuart. I'm just, I'm On just, me? Yep. Then I'll, I'll screen share and just introduce you and get the class, the uh, session going. <clears throat> So let me try sharing my screen here. Cool. So welcome everyone. We're into, I think this is actually week eight, week eight of facilitating online learning. We're streaming through the course. And uh, we've got a special guest with us today, which is Dr. Stuart Hayes. And I've known Stuart sort of online for a number of years uh, through his work with uh, Hudigodji and um, got to meet him a couple of times actually. Um, so once, um, quite unusually, uh, in, in the South Island, um, I was down there on sabbatical for three months in Nelson and uh, heard about a special guest who was coming to, to speak and just turned out to be Stuart Hayes. Um, which was was quite fun to meet up, and uh, then this year, beginning in February, we run our annual Scholarship of Technology Enhanced Learning Symposium, and uh, this year Stuart was one of our keynote speakers, our trendsetters. So that was that was really cool. So as far as we're ahead with the course, if you have a look at the course summary on Canvas, uh, you can see we're into. Uh, week eight, and so due this week is your third blog post, your reflective critical post, uh, and then the fourth one is during week 10. So looking forward to seeing a bit more activity on your blogs again this week. I see there have been some posts and some comments, which is fantastic. And if we scroll down, what have we covered so far? Um, so we're into week eight. And we're looking at Hurigodji with Dr. Stuart Hayes. So we're into week eight. This is module for week eight. I'll put a few extra links and notes there if you want to follow up on some of the stuff that Stuart will be talking to us about and discussing with us. Um, there's the keynote from the symposium in February. And I've also put here from one of the publications that uh, Lisa Marie Blask and Stuart Hayes have done. Um, some of the principles 
around how to design for hudagogy. And I think that's probably one of the questions people have is how do we do it? Nice idea, but how do we do it? So that'll, I think that'll be part of the key to the discussion today. Um, also got a few links there. I think Stuart just touched on the uh, hudagogy community practice earlier while we were just waiting for people to join. Um, there's some nice uh, information from Fred Garnett in the UK. And uh, he's got some good slides there around the World Hudagogy Day. His blog is actually quite interesting if you want to have a read through it. He's got a nice theme around sort of equating how uh, the Beatles write music or write music and the concepts of Hudagogy. Hudagogy. Uh, and uh, this is blog and there's a few publications. I think Stuart's made a call out for the latest version of uh, a collated book around horticulture and practice. So we have a Google Doc. So that's linked off the week eight uh, module from Canvas. So if you've got some burning questions that you want to ask Stuart as we're going along, it might be a good idea to stick them into that Google Doc. Um, so if we run out of time to actually ask them today, we could flick them off to Stuart and maybe Stuart could uh, you know, give us some excellent informed responses to those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so well. I'm going to throw it over to Stuart and uh, he's got a bit of a presentation for us. Take us through the basics and then we'll come back to these questions. Oh, and just before we go, uh, just a reminder about our Google map. Just want to point out that, uh, although we haven't actually been advertising it, it is publicly open. And so we've had over 1300 views of our, of our wonderful map. If your name's not on the map, you're missing out on, you know, all that, uh, all that exposure and uh, finding yourself around the web. Um, our Flipboard curated magazine, getting a few more posts there. So once you've done your post for this week, it might be good to curate that into that Flipboard magazine. Join the Twitter discussion we were just discussing before of uh, Galile's awesome two tweets. Now, I'm sure he'll be adding to that. Um, so I've been sharing a fair bit of information and links there as well. Uh, so our tags explorer around the Twitter hashtag for the, for the community is really starting to grow, which is good to see that I'm not the entire focus of that anymore. We've got a few other nodes there starting to grow, which is cool. Don't forget our Mendeley shared library of um, articles that may be relevant to online learning. Great to see Andrea's pup, uh, put something in there. And also our ResearchGate community. So over to Stuart. I'll stop screen sharing and allow Stuart to take over. So yeah, welcome Stuart. It's great to have you here. Basically, uh, one of the fathers of uh, uh, the concept of hudagogy uh, way back in 2001, I think the first publication was, wasn't it? 2000. 2000. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Over to me. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah. Well, actually, some, um, there's some discussion about whether it was 2000 or 2001. Somebody, I think, um, um, made a mistake in a citation somewhere and everybody keeps copying the same citation. The original paper is no longer available because Altibase closed down, but there's a National Archives of Australia have got it. So um, anyway, it doesn't matter. It was around then and it's not going to change the world, is it? Um, well, thanks for, for, um, for being here. Uh, as Woody Allen said, 90% of life is turning up. So we've done 90%. We've just got 10% to go. Um, um, Tom's asked me just to talk briefly for about 10 minutes, and uh, which, which I'll do briefly, uh, but I've got an engaging activity for you first. Um, but um, hoitagogi or self-determined learning, I, I don't know whether you guys have read anything about it or whatever, but um, if hoitagogi is true to its main principles, uh, that if, then if you have an interest in it, then you will um, be self-determined and you'll go and find out. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk about how that works in a minute. Um, what I'd like you just to kick off with is um, I want you just for one minute just to think and, and maybe you can write them down if, you, if your memory is as bad as mine is. Um, I want you to think about if you were going to learn some new skill um, tomorrow, 
um, how you'd actually go about it. Now, this this is a this is a painting, all right. This is. Oh, I mean, you, you need to um, turn your screen sharing back on, Stuart. Oh, I've not turned it on. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, well, that would help, wouldn't it? Oh, I've done. Um, you have? Oh, okay, yeah. I've probably just hidden the window myself. <laughs> yeah, we see it. Oh, can good. Yeah, we can it see is it. There. Can you okay. see my wonderful painting of the Olgas? Yes. That's the Olgas. Um, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry about that. I I took that's right. I took up painting about five years ago, and um, well, a bit more, and um, as a new skill. So, what I what I want you to think about just for a minute, yeah. How would how would you go about learning a new skill, like painting or whatever, or, or using Twitter? Or oh, using Twitter? That's <laughs> right. Or using Twitter, or catching ferrets, or just. So one of the things I've been um, doing recently is, is learning different instruments, mainly so I can teach my grandchildren. And uh, <laughs> I, I guess the fundamental way I've been doing that is looking at YouTube videos, you know, yep. full licks on the ukulele. Yep, that's it. Is that Tom, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. So YouTube. Yeah, that's right. So hitting YouTube. The rest of it, somebody, somebody else like, yeah, so it's YouTube. That's one thing. What else do we, what, what else do you think? we might do and what did I do I think it varies depending on the skill you want to learn mm. <laughs> to some extent I think uh, you know learning how to edit videos or something I'd look at Adobe tutorials online uh, okay. learning how to catch a ferret I'd probably ask a ferret catcher you know okay. I'd ask a ferret <laughs> That's catcher the first point yeah and then, so I think it's a matter of priority you know some some skills have a more practical bent that you probably want to actually get some inside knowledge on. Others, you know, uh, researching is probably the first point of call. Okay, so talking to an ex so we've got YouTube going on the internet, talking to an expert. What else? Uh, ferret, ferret catching for dummies. Very catching for dummies, so you might read yeah. something, yeah. So yeah, you might, we could read the manual. You could read the manual, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, read the manual before you put the IKEA furniture together rather than afterwards. Yeah, that, that sort of thing. Good. What else? Have a go, trial and error. Trial and error. Oh, how about that? So how about a bit of failing? Does that work? <laughs> yeah, messing about, failing, stuffing it up. Um, yep, yeah. excellent. Oh, Thank you. Find a course. Sorry? Uh, enroll into a course to learn something. Yeah, you might enroll in the course. Yeah, you might you might decide to go and do that. Yep. Anything else? Great. I find often the uh, read the manual approach is quite frustrating because uh, <laughs> invariably it's written in Chinese English. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, and if it comes, to, I've got a theory that the North Koreans uh, don't want to take us over militarily, but they're going to send us crazy because they don't complete all the instructions when you've got something. There's always one missing, so we're going to go <laughs> or leave out one screw out of the IKEA pack. Yeah, that's right. We, which, to a psychologist like me, is really interesting <laughs> that you would do that. Anyway, okay. So let's let's move on. Um, so yeah, and what, the question I have then is, who would be designing the learning process? Who'd be in charge? Go on, have a guess. Who'd be in charge? Who'd be designing the learning process? We would be we, in charge. Yeah, would. you'd be in charge. We would. Yeah, yeah the learner. Yeah. Yeah, the learner. So it'd be it would be what we call learner-centric learning. So, um, and and you might use a guru, and you might enrol in a course, but you'd probably decide when and where you did that, and and where it was applicable. Um, but you'd largely be the agent of of the learning, and one of the things that um, is interesting about Hoitagoi, even though people think that it's about adult learning, um, children, in fact, are very um, capable learners right from the womb. And if you've got children or had children, or, or Tom, if you're getting grandchildren like I have, um, hordes of them, um, you'll notice that they learn straight from the start. And um, they're very good at doing this kind of stuff. 
because what they do is, and what you, you're doing is we learn by hypothesize testing. We, we hypothesize, don't we, about the world. We think, and this is what children do. They look at the world and they think, I wonder how that works. And they go mess with it. And then find that it's hot and then so they learn not to do it again. So they hypothesize tests, they explore, they fail, they mess up. Um, they usually mix with other kids. They watch other people. They, they watch you if you're a parent, which is kind of a bit unfortunate sometimes. Um, and, and they watch you and learn from you by, by vicarious learning. They explore. Um, and, and they're very good at that. And, and, and until they get to probably high school, most primary school education is pretty good. Um, they get to high school and then it's beaten out of them because then they've got to sit in chairs and uh, just listen to uh, somebody some Latin or French um, and then they get to university and it gets even worse or it did you in the old university oh, not not at your university of course but um, <laughs> then, you, then you've got to sit at a lecture theatre with 800 other people and, and so forth so um, so we're, we're born sorry I think we probably need oh, some, just some background mm, noise there. Some oh, right. muting. The, ho the host can mute everyone but sorry that's, that's probably my there. kids Okay. <laughs> it's your kids. Um, so anyway, just just to quickly, but yeah. So we we know how to learn. We and, and if you look at children, yeah, they they learn by exploring whatever, and they learn by the kind of processes that you describe. So fundamentally, um, and what's interesting is that that's supported by the neuroscience, and and a lot of hoitagogical principles are based on on neuroscientific evidence, which is really kind of handy because we haven't really had a lot of concrete evidence. Um, at all about so that, that was part of what, what we should have done at the uh, start there, Stuart, was get you to introduce yourself and your background in psychology. Uh, well, yeah, I didn't. I, I, yeah, I didn't think it was necessary. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a shrink by uh, trade. Uh, I was a nurse originally, but uh, yeah, a shrink by trade. And um, so neuroscience is particularly interesting to me. And, and you, if you read a lot of the stuff that I've written, it certainly has a psychological bent. Um, so neuroscience is something I'm fascinated by. Um, after this, I'm going off to see patients. They're still, so I'm still doing clinical work. Um, so, yeah, the neuroscientific evidence, which is really kind of handy because we have some solid evidence about how it is that people learn. And guess what? They learn by exploring and, and, and all the things that we've talked about, enhanced memory, they use different modalities. Um, and one of the things we definitely know, and I'm completely out of character now doing this, is that we don't necessarily learn by just listening. Um, so... Um, it might it might help in some respects, but it's not the only way. So different modalities and memory obviously is is, is essential to learning. So anyway, I don't, I don't want to talk too long, so let's let's I'll sort of move on. But learning my way. So we design our own learning, and that's what Hoytagogi is underpinned by the idea of learner agency, which is based on human agency. And you can look it up. It's um it's a philosophical um, concept, human agency that's been around since um, Aristotle. Um, and, uh, and other philosophers, and um, and more recently in the psychological literature, under the with a book called um, Albert Bandura. But learner agency is is, you know, and you might like the slide on the right there. Uh, get the baby gate. They said it'll keep them safe. It said um, we have we have agency, um, and and agency means that we're actually in control of 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 our learning, so that that we can exert control. And there are two types of people in the world. Uh, in this, in, in regards to agency, there are those that believe that we don't have agency and it's all about fate um, and that some other kind of thing out there is kind of controlling what we do. Um, uh, and there are people like me, I guess, who believe that we do have agency and that we can, in fact, exert an influence on our environment. So learner agency is at the heart of Wittigogi. So there was an interesting yeah. thing on, on uh, the news in New Zealand just last night. Um, Stuart, which your slide, uh, uh, previous slide, just reminded me of, where a two-year-old climbed out a window of an apartment building <laughs> and uh, managed to, you know, hold on to the air conditioning unit for a few seconds before he lost his grip and then basically <laughs> fell down two floors, but someone watching managed to catch him, so he was fine. Wow. So that actually does happen, yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Yeah. I think there are probably better ways to learn, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's I wouldn't way. recommend that one. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a definition, of the, if, you look, if you do read any of the st stuff we've written, the kind of definition of hoitagogy has changed slightly, I suppose, um, over time. But this one is kind of the main um, definition that, that we've been using. And Lisa Marie Blaschke, who's a bit of a stalwart, has been using. Um, you can see it's engaged, it's concerned with learner-centered learning. 
And where the important part there, the learner is the major agent in their own learning. And I'd like to just take that bit. The learner is the major agent in their own learning. Um, and just take that. Um, so it, it, as we move forward. So, Hotogogi um, emphasizes process. You can see there, you've got a map and a compass. Um, whereas on the left, there's this kind of need to emphasize content. And before the internet, and before, and even before that, before libraries, I mean, you definitely needed gurus to actually tell you what, what the world was like um, and to tell you what to experience. But we don't no longer have to go down that route, uh, particularly since libraries, but even so more now where we have a much more egalitarian approach to, to education where people can access information. So it's about process. So Hutagogi is not concerned with content because we believe that content can be found, um, but really about process and it's the process of learning. And I think uh, any criticism that I would have of pedagogy, for example, and, and maybe andragogy is that it's, it has had an emphasis on content. So the neuroscience I've mentioned, there's Homer's brain. So a lot of it based on, on neuroscience. Um, the other thing is uh, if you were interested in, and again, if you just read our stuff, you'll find, you'll come across um, these things, constructivism, which you probably know familiar with all these terms, but these are the kind of origins of it as well as the neuroscience. Um, constructivism, humanism, double of learning, systems thinking, complexity, learner managed learning and capability. So, um, and it, again, these will pop up in the horticultural literature. So there is some kind of basis um, to it as well as the neuroscience. So I guess what you're interested in, what does all this mean? <laughs> I mean, and that was such a small sharp snapshot. Uh, and normally I would have done a horticultural approach if we had several hours, which would be to send you away um, to go and uh, and do a flipped classroom technique where you go away and do some research and come back and deliver um, particular parts of the concepts that we've been talking about, but we've only got 10 minutes, so um, I'm out of character. So some of the things that have been used in university education in particular, uh, but also in schools and in TAFE, obviously, uh, vocational education, um, less so in, um, in um, probably workplaces, but there is some evidence of Hutchikogi being used in, Hutchikog, in, in um, workplace learning. So one of, them, the, one of the key focuses is to negotiate learning. Where the, and that's that bit about in the definition that describes how um, learners become a, a partner with the teacher in their own learning. So to negotiate learning, how am, I, how am I going to learn this? So you can provide, so the process is negotiable. The content's not. I get, we get a lot of criticism from people, particularly universities, um, who say, well, you're just, you know, you're just throwing the curriculum out the window. On the contrary, the curriculum is still the guide. Um, there's still a content to be learned. There's still assessments to be passed. There's still standards to be held, but the process can be negotiated. So it's how you actually get there. Um, it probably may or may not interest you to know that I, I, I don't think I or maybe went to one class at university in the whole of my university education. Um, but um, so negotiated learning, and still managed to kind of negotiate my way through it. So negotiated learning. Yeah, um, I, I think the key is it's, it's really focused on developing learner capabilities and, yeah. and, and uh, capacities and not just uh, competence. Well, yeah, we, if we get time, we could certainly look at that, Tom. But yeah, that, that's a theme that runs through um, Hoitagogi, and that is the notion that competence and capability are quite different things. And competence is the lowest level, the lowest standard, whereas um, um, capability is a much higher, higher kind of ability. Um, competence only measures your, part, your ability to do things in the past. Um, capability is about being able to do things in novel ways. Usually competence is in novel context. Um, so learner managed context. Um, Tom mentioned Fred, Fred Garnett. Um, this Fred and, and Nigel Ecclesfield and others in the UK uh, did some lovely work around learner managed context. And what they do is they present material um, say they give students material and then they ask the student to contextualize it. And uh, Tom might remember that at the, at the SOTOL conference, I used um, um, a model for that where um, context is everything. And you, you determine as a psychologist, again, this is interesting to me where we, we will see, we will all see something the same, but we'll contextualize it differently and we make different sense of it. Um, and you probably see this on Twitter. <laughs> um, um, Lyle, um, yeah. people making sense of the same things in different kind of ways. So learn and manage context. So context is everything, the way in which we learn stuff. I think that also learning. links into yep. one of the other concepts we've discussed uh, 
is the, uh, yeah learner generated context and and some of Lucan's work, which um, yeah, uh, of course, uh, um, Lucan and and, and uh, Garnet were partners for all that day anyway. Yep. And Ecclesfield <laughs> and yeah, about four or five others. Yeah, Lucan's work. Yeah, so you've, you've looked at that already, um, which is I, I think absolutely critical. Um, experiential learning, um, obviously. So learning by experience, learn by doing, um, rather than just uh, listening. Now, this one will be one that um, will um, warm the cockles of your heart, and that's the notion of flexible assessment. Um, the problem with universities, of course, is that they have academic boards. And um, um, in the past, when I was a, an aging academic, um, academic boards could be very difficult to get, get around in, when you start talking about flexible assessment, because there was this kind of funny belief that everybody had to be assessed in the same kind of way. Um, I think you can still do that, but, but the, the idea of a negotiated assessment has taken on in lots of different places, and particularly universities overseas, uh, where the student, the, within certain boundaries, obviously, um, the student is able to, and it, and it goes back to learn and manage context, are able to actually negotiate their assessment. And I, I actually, as a university academic, I actually, I did this for quite a number of years. Um, once I got it through academic board, which was a fight in itself. But um, able to have flexible assessment, particularly at the postgraduate level. Um, but I think it's doable at an undergraduate level. And that enables the learner to actually contextualize their, what they're doing in their assessments. And the assessment then um, doesn't, goes beyond becoming a, um, whoops, oh, oh, oh. Um, the, um, just let me get out of here. Um, the, uh, the assessment then becomes a learning experience rather than just a formative assessment. And that's, a, that's a, something I'm very passionate about. Um, the flipped classroom technique, which you're probably familiar with, which is what I've just described, where you get the, the <coughs> learners to go away and um, do parts of, uh, do their research, as uh, I think it was Jeanette said, uh, and come back with their research and, and present and so forth. So flipping the classroom. Um, another one is project-based learning. This is, a, this is a big one, and particularly in the UK. Um, some high schools over in Australia are, are doing this, um, a lot of project-based learning, and there's some lovely examples that I could describe to you if, if, if you're ever interested, um, but around projects where groups of people get together and do projects. There, there's one at a school in Brisbane where they, they get a shipping container, a, a shipping container in, and they turn it into a classroom and then t get it sent to a um, overseas country. And, and within the project, the kids have to use maths, English, <laughs> geography, <laughs> they have to use you know, all sorts of different skills in order to negotiate this so that the curriculum is covered by doing this massive project, which has some good in the world and blah, blah, blah. But it's a massive project. I mean, it doesn't have to be that big. Um, double learning and reflective practice, uh, Don, Sher Don Shern's work. Um, action research, which is a, a love of mine, um, which is a particular approach to doing research, particularly which involves uh, change. Uh, the search process. Um, the PAH continuum, um, Tom kind of mentioned, and that's going from pedagogy to andragogy to hoitagogy. So you might have some learners who find it difficult to transition to hoitagogy because of their socialization at school. Um, so what you do is you start with the pedagogical approach, shift to andragogical approach where you bring in their experiences and then shift to hoitagogy in the course of, say, a semester. Um, and Fred used the lovely example of the Beatles. Have we got time for just me to mention that, Tom? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yes, yes. We've got good. tons of time. Oh, good. Okay. Um, uh, 10 minutes was just kind of like the idea to yeah. get people thinking. Oh, okay. All right. Um, the, the PAH continuum, Fred talked about the Beatles, and he said that um, he wrote this lovely chapter in our first book about how when the Beatles started off, they were copying basically all the rock and roll artists. You know, they were, rock, they were a rock and roll band, and uh, Little Richard and all those kind of um, singers, you know, which I, even I remember. Um, I'm old enough. Um, and then they went to more, when he, when he said that when they got to Revolver, because he's a bit of an aficionado about, with the Beatles, he said that when they got to Revolver, they were starting to be andragogical, where they started to introduce different styles of music into their play, and it became more than rock and roll. And they became hoitagogical with Sgt. Peppers. I don't know if any of you remember, whether you're old enough like I am, to remember when Sgt. Peppers came out, but everybody went like, oh, yeah, what's this? And there was a bit of a, a, bit of a revolution for a while, but... Um, uh, the, the Sergeant Peppers was in a shift to Hoitagogi where they were doing definitely self-determined stuff and very creative. So that, so that Fred used that to describe how 
when you really don't know anything about something, you start pedagogically and you have to, you kind of follow and listen and whatever. And then you become andragogical where you bring your own experience into it. And then you can become hoitagogical. And so, so part of the implications there, Stuart, might be that, you know, if we gave our students hallucinogenic drugs, they might, you know, <laughs> move towards yeah. hoitagogy. Yeah, well, well, that's right. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll become famous before I die. Yeah, um, before I die. Um, yeah, that, that <laughs> maybe that's the case. But certainly uh, this shift. So um, there was a, 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 I can't remember her name now, um, a student from America wrote a, a chapter in our book. She was a distance ed student. And she had a lecturer who used a hoitagogical approach. This is our second book, um, Brandt. Brand. Um, and she described how it was really difficult for her to transition to this hoitagogical approach this lecturer was using online. Uh, but then when she got to really love it, when she went back to do another subject, um, she hated it because the, the person was being very didactic. So, mm. you know, one, once you've had your hallucinating drug, um, Tom, you, you hooked forever. Um, and the teacher is a supporter and facilitator rather than the guru. Um, you've probably heard the thing about the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage kind of idea. Uh, there's the Beatles. Um, yeah, the PAH continuum. Yeah. So, uh, just very briefly, um, if, if you want to, I think I wrote a paper on this once, which didn't go dip down too well with a few people, but um, the idea that I, I, I don't like to talk about teaching, I like to talk about learning leading, leading learning or the learning leader, because um, teacher is kind of like, it, it's connotations of the teacher being dominant. Um, yeah, I agree. I think quite often it's just the terminology you use yeah. Uh, pigeonholes you into a particular pedagogy, doesn't it? So. It does absolutely, and that's why I'd like to see teacher and and I don't I don't use student either. Um, I call them learners. So trying to shift out. You're right. I mean that's the way language works. I mean language is about concepts, and and language determines the way or, or describes the way in which we think. Yeah, and so, even even the the uh, the technology tools that you use. So yeah, I mean we we had a bit of discussion earlier on about. Uh, PowerPoint and how it basically pushes everyone into a teacher-centric model. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So in order to be a learning leader in my world, <laughs> welcome to my world, happy with ambiguity, you've got to be able to lose control and lose power. You have to be able to understand people. See, that's a, that's a scary thing, isn't it? It's a scary thing oh. for, for a lot of educators is uh, losing control. Absolutely. Or, Absolutely. or thinking they're going to lose control. And, and to, it's, it, you know, and Tom, it goes beyond common sense. Um, it goes beyond logic, which, you know, as a psychologist, I shouldn't talk about logic because what, what the hell is it? But I remember talking to a woman once in New Zealand who was working in a polytechnic. She was a nurse educator. And she was working in a polytechnic. She told me how she stayed up all night. Well, I was running a leadership course. And she said she was so tired because she stayed up all night doing 44 slides for her students. And so that she could do a three hour lecture with these 44 slides. And I said to her, why do you do? And oh, she was also complaining that she couldn't um, uh, mark all her assignments and get all her work done. And I said, well, why don't you just give the students some projects, you know, around the thing and send them away for three hours, mark all your papers and when they come back or send them away for two hours and then they come back and do their presentations. And, and in the end, she said, no, it's easy, easier to stay up at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> Yeah, and do the PowerPoint slides and kill my students. Yeah, yeah. it sounds yeah. like my yeah. first year of teaching. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. I remember when I was a nurse. I was a nurse educator too, and and I remember. Yeah, you're dead right. I just could not lose control. So anyway, it has to be partnership relationship rather than a, a teacher dominated um, process and not content oriented. So you got your content. You know what it is. As long as the learner knows what it is, they've got to learn and where it is and got the resources. I mean. It should be all about process. Um, I've got this thing about we need to be scientists, um, coach and guide, and a facilitator. I think that was, it. Oh, and, and we actually have to be a learner as well. So these were my new skills for the learning leader for the 21st century. So that's it. Oh, it's been used all over the world in all sorts of contexts. So, and if you look at some of the work, then it's used extensively. So that's my very quick intro. Um, to uh, to which Gogi, I'm sure if you're excited about it, you'll there's plenty to go and read, and um, uh, you can always contact me if you'd like to talk to talk any more, or if you want to. I'm mean, part of the discussion we're going to have now, but more than happy to um, field your 
emails and um, if you want to ask questions and if you want some resources, but I'm sure Tom, Tom has more, more resources, I'm sure, about horticulture than I do. So that's it. Over to you, Tom. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd just like to basically throw it open to a discussion. Um, so we do have uh, a few questions. So I think you've kind of answered uh, Daniel's already because Daniel put into the, uh, the chat of the peers problem based learning is based on or linked to hudagogy. And uh, I think you kind of, you know, uh, talked about how effectively problem based learning is one approach that you can yep. use. Yep. Uh, and then we've got a, we've got four questions that are on the Google Doc, but um, keen to to throw it open to anyone. Just to, let's have a brainstorm discussion with Stuart while he's here. Let's make the most of of, of his brain. And uh, <laughs> what little is left? <laughs> um, <clears throat> that would be great. So Paula, I think, has been quite interested in this whole concept. So we we kind of had a little bit of blog discussion around um, you know. What, what sort of adult uh, teaching theories are, are like some of the, you know, what the, the, the teaching approaches for, for children? And uh, for example, we were discussing uh, Montessori uh, mm. kindergarten education. You know, it's all about discovery and problem-based learning. So throw it over to Paula, your question. Right, thank you. Thank you for the uh, very clarifying presentation, Stuart. Um, I am, now that you've mentioned a few things about, uh, particularly about the having a curriculum, so having kind of a guideline, so it's not completely loose, no. it's not a, a blank no. slate, as I saw in one of the chapters that I was reading from um, Hitagogy in Action, which makes sense. Um, but now I am pretty puzzled about the, um, the nuanced difference between self-directed learning and self-determined learning seems, yeah, it seems to be very close. Where, where does it lie? Uh, Cause it seems to be a further down the track on the continuum of um, being more to the learner, uh, up to the learner, the whole learning experience, but I'm still very um, confused about both of them. If you could clarify that, that'd be great. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, there's a, there's actually, a, I wrote, I actually got so frustrated with people using the word self-directed learning instead of self-determined that I wrote a blog on it for the COP, Hortagogi COP website. Um, so there's actually a, a reply on there if you wanted to go and have a look. Um, but yeah, in brief, um, yeah, self-directed learning came from uh, a guy called Malcolm Knowles um, and um, really got incorporated into andragogy um, where people can go out and just, um, you know, go find material and stuff. Um, we've incorporated self-directed learning as a, as a kind of a component of self-determined because self-determined learning, because it's a little bit, it is a little bit different. Self-determined learning is the sense in which you dis, you, you're actually going to be in control of the process. If I'm a, a, a learning leader and, and you and want, want my learners to be self-directed, then I'm still directing traffic. I'm still saying, well, you go away and, and do a self-directed learning, for example, is uh, the centerpiece of flipped classroom because you, you, you're giving something to the student and saying to the learner and you're saying, okay, here's, I want you to go and look at um, a particular thing. I want you to go and look up Hortagogi and its, and its main principles, come up with the 19 principles. So they'll go away and that their component is to look up that part. Um, they're being self-directed because they're they're going out and, and and doing it without being but but they're they're not self-determined it's not about agency so self-directed is a much it's kind of a, a part of the process it's not the way in which we describe the learner it's not about agency you can be a self-directed learner and still not have agency um, yeah I guess my example would be you know I, 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 when I was had my first degree my undergraduate degree in engineering um, you know, some of, some of the papers were just so absolutely boring. Uh, <laughs> and so I went to the, maybe the first lecture, got completely disillusioned, just looked up the past five years of exams and uh, just swatted the exam. Uh, yeah. And all the questions were in the exam. So I passed, you know, at least four papers by probably going to one at the most lectures out of, out of an entire, you know, six month course. Yeah. So uh, I guess that's probably what I would call self-directed self learning. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great example. Yeah, great example. 
Does that help you, Paula, at all? Yes, yes, uh, it, it, it does help. Um, I am still, I think it's, it's a very thin line there in the sense of, because uh, you do have boundaries for um, self-determined learning as you were, learner, as you were saying, but it's very much more loose. That's, that's where, I, where I'm getting it. I think one of the key principles that, that makes it slightly different is the, uh, the idea of negotiation and assessment. Right. Oh, and negotiation right. is a whole learning process as yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, you know, right. if someone had gone to his lecturer and said, listen, I'm not coming to any more classes. Um, I'm just going to go and learn this stuff by myself. And I've got the exam questions for the last five years. So I'll catch you. Right. I'll the, exam. Uh, the, the, the lecturer might, you know, would still be part of, I mean, that would be negotiated learning, but I'm guessing, 20 years ago or whenever it was that Tom did his engineering thing. It wouldn't well, have been longer than that. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that. I was to be nice. um, so self-directed, self being self-directed, self-directed learning is a, is a process like the classroom, whereas self-determined learning is more of a philosophy. Well, philosophy, I don't want to use the word philosophy. It's, it's more about the attitude of the learner. Uh, the fact that they're, they're an explorer, that they're a um, hypothesis, Framer, they test hypotheses, that kind of stuff. It's more of a, if you like, broader framework about what, how we understand the learner and, and how we understand them as a person who's got agency over their own learning. A self-directed learner doesn't necessarily have that. Yeah, and I think that, that comes down to that, you know, when we briefly talked about uh, the difference between competency and uh, capacity or capability building, capability. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it's about can someone learn in an unknown environment or, you know, solve a problem that no one solved before? Um, and that's, that's where it comes down. The difference between, you know, self-determined or self-directed. Um, you can be self-directed and solve you know, yeah. the, a problem that anyone's done before in a different way. But how do you, how do you build the capacity for your students to be able to be creative and, and work in completely unknown environments, which uh, the, that's what the world is. Yeah, no, that you've, you've described the difference between competence and capability very well. I, had, I actually had a diagram there that I could have, could have showed you. But um, yeah, it, it's, Tom's right. It's about capability is about unknown context. Um, my father was a bricklayer and, uh, or was a builder and, and a bricklayer. But he could build the, you know those arches that you can build with the bricks kind of like that and they kind of hang yeah. there? He, yeah. I, I asked him to show me how, to, how he did that once and he, and he couldn't tell me how he did it. He was a very competent bricklayer, but this was capability. This was going an unknown. So if something went wrong, he could design it and fix it in particular ways. So this kind of um, intelligence that was in his fingertips, um, and he was you know, quite. That's capability. Whereas competence is just the ability to put bricks together. So it's yeah, more of a creative slant. Yeah. Um, so I th I think I'm 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 finally getting where. It, uh, I'm a bit confused. So uh, a bit of my background is that I do research in self-regulated learning. And I know that that's one of the um, pillars, foundations of um, hirtagogy. Um, Self-determined learning. Self-determined learning, all right. But, um, and uh, that is also very, um, very much important in, pedagogy and self-determined learning, but it's, it's, uh, so I think the, the way that the learning happens is seen the same way while pedagogy, self-determined learning and self-directed um, learning is more about how the environment, um, more like an educational approach on how to address uh, the learner's characteristics so sort of uh, self-regulation and, and the agency that the student has that capability, it's not that it's completely ignored in the other ones. It's just that it's how we set the environment, which is the educational approach, would be a combination of both. The, am I uh, rambling here or does that make sense? Because it's... I can see from a psychological point of view, self-regulation, lear self-regulated learning is all about the learner and how the learners learn. 
But when you come from an educational point of view, it, it's a lot about the environment and how we set up that environment. So yeah, when you talk about yeah. agency, uh, it's not that pedagogy and self-directed learning don't see that the learner also has agency, but for some circumstances, it's just not being uh, part of the learning design of that situation. As you explain, uh, if you're learning something new, uh, you might need a pedagogical approach at first yep. Yep. and then yep. start moving in the continuum because as a learner and go, going back to self-regulated learning skills in that domain, you don't have, you just don't have the skills for that domain. And then you, you will learn, you go on a different continuum. Is that, is that uh, close to uh, your views or am I? Yeah, no, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's yeah, very close to yeah, the way I would, I would see it. Um, okay. The, with the, with the self-directed learning, um, compare, let's say you've got a map, you've got a map, you know, a street map, um, a, a, a map of England and or Australia or whatever, and, and you're using the map and it's got roads on it and whatever. Compare that. That's to me, and, and you might give somebody the map and say, go find, go and find your way to Bathurst, you know? So you go and find your way to Bathurst. That's self-directed. For me, self-determined would be giving them a compass, but no map. So it's giving them the tools. Right. Yep. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so I guess what we're, what, what Hood right. Godge is not advocating is that you, you no longer have a place for the teacher or, or oh, no. designing learning. And uh, that, that's certainly not the case at all. It's a completely different yep. approach to designing the learning environment. Yep. That's exa that's beautifully put. Thanks. That's very clarifying. Your role clarifying. as a teacher becomes quite different. Yep. So um, there non, are a few questions yeah. there on the, on the Google yeah. Doc. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of the things we kind of debated a little bit is how do, how do you apply this in, in uh, you know, undergraduate uh, um, teaching rather than just in postgrad because it seems to, you know, fit quite nicely with PhD students, etc. cetera. Um, but how can we do this in undergraduate learning? And, and the other key thing that people sort of can't quite conceptualize how do you do this with really large classes yeah with with great difficulty and i, I acknowledge that um well when i was teaching university although yeah yeah um because i was using hojigogi long before we wrote about it um i i would design a three-year program with largely pedagogical processes in say the first year Andragogical processes in the second year, and and then hortagogical approaches in the third year. So it's a scaffolding approach. Yeah, a scaff yeah. So scaffolding the learning, and and that made most sense to me. And I I'm still of that view that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if I'm going in to learn architecture or medicine or whatever, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. So you've got to kind of get back. So I I I, I do go. I, I have had some arguments with the PAH. I've had argued a lot with Fred and Lisa Marie about the PAH continuum because. Um, there's an assumption that this is only for hortagogy is only for adults, and that's nonsense. This, this is for children too, and in fact, a lot of it's been written. A lot of hortagogical stuff's been written about hortagogy for children um, because they know how to do it. So I, I, I kind of have problems with the PAH continuum in the sense that it gets assumed that you can only teach children using pedagogy, and it's it's nonsense. But in the context of, and again learning generated context comes into this. If I don't know anything about like when I turned up to do my first psychology lectures, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And so, yeah, that scaffolding approach seems to make sense for me. Um, I think it, I, I agree with you. I think with 1500 students, I mean, that says something about the systems and the design. Yeah. Uh, the, it's more about the economics, isn't it? Than, well, than it, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's about turning out sausages as I talked about at the conference. Mm. You might remember, <laughs> I hope it didn't upset too many people, but yeah, I mean, the way in which we've, we've designed our educational systems, we're more interested in turning out sausages than we are, in actual fact, turning out creative people. But I do think, you know, the negotiated, um, I mean, the negotiated assessment would be something I think you could do with a large number of students, where you would provide um, some guidelines, but they'd be allowed to pick the context. So you could just move it just very slightly, you know, so you don't make it too difficult. And I'm assuming that one person's not marking all the 1500 assignments. So you, you could... You could just, you know, 
easily negotiate, let them, to, so you don't have to individually negotiate with the students, but um, with the learners, but have them at least provide the context. Um, yeah, so and you can also do things like have peer review and peer marking. Yeah. And uh, basically yeah. divide, you know, large classes up into small groups that way. Yeah, particularly in the digital sphere. Yeah, the, you know, the sphere that you work in, Tom. Um, in fact, you know more about that. Well, everyone's I'm, kind of uh, being forced into a digital mode at this point. But. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, and certainly because we're using webinars or we're using, um, you know, the tutorial approach. I mean, you've got tutorials with maybe 20, 30 students. I mean, learners. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't do flipped classroom techniques. I've, I'm doing it at UTS, even on webinars, using webinars. There are ways around it if you really want to do it. I, I agree that it's not ideal, but you can do it. Um, you can negotiate some of the learning at least um, and get people moving away from a more didactic approach. Yeah. So I think one of the other questions um, I think particularly Paula kind of raised was, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you design or approach Horikoji uh, in the learning environment when you've got, you know, a whole range of, of students with different abilities? You know, some, some of still want to be spoon fed and some of that's cultural as well. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, how, how, do you, how do you bring that into a classroom when you've got such a huge range of student capacities to start with? Yeah, the, the business about you, you people who want to be spoon fed. Yeah, that's why, that's why I think the scaffolding, I, I would still use a scaffolding approach. And again, it depends on the size of your class. If you've got a relatively small class, then you can, you can in fact, easily negotiate for the, you know, the fastest, faster learners. And, and primary school teachers, um, have to cope with this all the time uh, and even high school um, teachers because they have students mm. at different levels so I think um, you know individually scaffolding letting letting again letting kids um, or, or students learners choose their own context um, allowing them to um, you know go to the higher level if they really can so that you have a kind of a base level for say assessment but they could go one step high. You can you can challenge them by giving them you know extra. So it can be done. And for this for the spoon feeders, the ones that um, have been socialised by their education environment to not be very independent. Um, yeah, you you're going to have to challenge them. And, and I'm I'm a great fan of that. Where you've got to push them. But again, you might have to use a scaffolding approach. So be a bit pedagogical and then gradually loosen the reins. It's a bit like having having a piece of rope, isn't it? You know you. You got a piece of rope on somebody, and, and you pull them close, and you have, have them very close to you, and then you gradually let let the rope go out. And if they get a bit lost, you can pull the rope mm. in a little bit, mm. and then let it out. Um, there are there are if if you do read a bit more about Hotogogi, there are about nineteen principles, um, which if you read those, they they might help because they actually do des describe how it is that you can actually do some of this, uh, do these kind of things with 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 groups of students. But that is a, it is an issue. Uh, and, and people will be at different levels and but it's the same as people with different capabilities you know some some learners are ready to kind of rock and roll and that's why the context stuff is really really important um, where they're able to actually go and, and, and explore things and and make sense of that within a particular framework yeah um, so I, I guess a couple of strategies um, one would be just make the uh, um, your, your approach explicit to your students because oh, absolutely. You know, they're, they're, absolutely. they're completely enculturated into being passive uh, yeah. and you know, they know how to pass an exam and, and uh, write an essay. But if you ask them to suddenly jump into problem-based learning uh, mm. or project-based, well, they've got no idea how to do that mm. and, or why, or why they're doing it. So I want really yeah. to make that explicit. Yeah. Why? What, why are we doing this? And what are, what are the outcomes for them? And, and really trying to point them perhaps to um, some key uh, examples in their profession. Absolutely. And, and you, you also need to go further than that because I know one of the issues in, in higher education in particular is that you'll get some, some learners in a group. If they're doing a group project, they won't contribute. Yeah. And the complaint is that the, smart, you know, the, the more diligent learners will do all the work. Um, so, yeah, I think those, you know, some very clear guidelines and, and ways in which that's going to be negotiated and your expectations are, are really need to be made clear right from the beginning. I run, uh, I still run workshops. Uh, well, when I do my, my online, my course with um, at UTS, with these, which I'm just doing, I start next week, um, again, on research methods, is I'm very clear about my approach. I'm very clear about the way it's going, this is, this is how, how it's going to run um, and this is what's going to happen. And 
what I find is that, you know, some people find that more difficult and again, cultural. Um, some people, you know, are used to being told. Um, and yeah, so there's a bit of negotiation goes on there really, but that's only a small group of students. So it's, it's not too difficult. Yeah. Trying to establish an ethos for yeah. the, uh, the, you know, that group of learners very early on. Yeah. I tell them that this is going to be different. I run workshops, uh, leadership workshop, workshops for the department of defense. And when I, go, when I turn up for work, when I used to turn up for workshops, I'd say, this is going to be different, you know, because they expect a very structured approach, death by PowerPoint for the day. And I, I get in there right at the beginning and I get them to talk to each other using only chicken talk, um, for example, to make it clear that this is going to be really difficult, different and set some expectations about how the day is going to be different um, and how it's, it's all about them, not about me. And we, we then start talking. One of the neatest ways to run an educational, any kind of workshop or webinar is simply if, if you've got the topic. I mean, the way I could have done this, for example, is if, if, if get you to pre-read something about hoitagogi, and then I could have said, okay, what I want you to do for five minutes is write down what are your major challenges in, in learning, in, in getting your students engaged and in, in, in you know, designing your learning. And, and in particular around hoitagogical principles. So what we would do then is, and then you'd come up with what your problems were, and we'd run the whole webinar or the whole workshop or whatever it is around your problems and issues. And that's very much a hoitagogical approach because it's, it's really learner generated, it's context um, and it's learner driven, it's not teacher driven. Do you get the idea? So it's a very simple question. What are your main challenges in whatever area that you want to talk about? And away you go. And you can run as long as you don't, as long as you're happy with ambiguity and you don't have to have a, a kind of a list of these are the things we've got to do today. The, the learners can actually um, determine the design of the workshop. But the, the downside is that you've got to really be on top of your subject and you really have to have lots of activities and lots of things under your belt to be able to pull out and say, well, let's have a go at this. Let's try this and do that. Yeah, and that's, that's also why a lot of people will default to PowerPoint model where um, that defines the limit of the conversation. And, you know, if I press the next, you know, the next slide, <laughs> I can just read my notes off there. And, yeah. you know, I've even seen, you know, some lecturers, um, <laughs> university lecturers, uh, even refuse to mark students' assignments because they asked questions in class. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's like, well, you know, um, <laughs> what's going on here? That's that's not a learning environment. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's lots of scope, um, even in the in this new world we're living in, where you know everything's by webinar or Zoom or you know digital, where you can still hand over control to the learner. You've just got to be able to give up the power and also be confident that you can actually come up with questions of your own and activities and things. To, yeah, I think it's about confidence. Yeah, you're dead right. But the PowerPoint makes it so much easier because um, you, yeah, yeah. you're, you're controlling the room. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's yeah, yeah. about the teacher-centric control and, and content. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be. You can use it in an engaging, learner-centric way, but it's just so much more difficult to do. You know? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it is and, and requires a lot of confidence. Paul has got her hand up, apparently. Paula has raised her hand. It's been up for a while, I think. Um, it, did she do it deliberately? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keen to hear more questions mm. from or thoughts from other people, um, worries, uh, you know. I, I think for me, the, the, the huge gap is how do we do this? Um, and, and, and it's not saying that that's, that's a problem as far as the, the, um, the concept goes. It's about having examples from different contexts of how to apply pedagogy within those various contexts so for me that's also an opportunity if you're interested in, in, in uh, you know really looking at the scholarship of, of teaching and learning and the scholarship of technology enhanced learning you know exploring how to do that within your own particular context can be something new and quite powerful and exciting I mean that's what our next book's about Tom is um, um, mainly it's a practitioner guide more than anything where people are talking about how they've applied it in different uh, different approaches, um, art and science and so forth. So yeah, because I think that's where what people want is how the hell do I do this? Although the process in a, in a sense is the same no matter where you kind of apply it. It's just, it's just maybe the, the nuance might be a little bit different. But it's as simple as I've described where, you know, for me, 
if I can just give my learners the confidence that the resources, the content is here. There's, the, you, you, there's where you can find the content. Okay, there, there it is, all the content that you ever need. And you can always come back and you can ask questions about that. And there's always that time for reflection and working through that. But where the process is negotiable. There's the content, here's the process. And the process is up to you to a certain extent. Um, um, where we're going to negotiate assessment, we're going to negotiate how we go about this. And it might be different for different learners. Um, like I said, I, I hardly went to a, a lecture or a session and I just went and did my own learning. Very self-directed, Paula, was I. Um, so, yeah, um, that's where I would start. And then, and then as we move along, it becomes more about the problems and issues for the learner. You know, what, are the, what kind of issues have come up for you? So it's very much learner-centric. Problem-based, Tom, I, I love problem-based learning. Um, love love project-based learning. Um, they all give people the scope. I even get the learners to negotiate and, and, and design their own projects. Yep. And yeah. maybe even um, the weighting of marks. Uh, well, that's mm. one. So there's a question in the chat from Daniel. Yeah. Um, so the question is, can you give us some examples about how to do this in research methods courses? So he says research method courses usually have a list of stuff people need to learn, um, which invariably that drives you towards a lecture mode or PowerPoint mode. So thoughts around that. Yeah. Well, again, again, well, with my current, this, this current course I'm running, I, the first one was a literature review course. They have to learn how to write a lit review and do a critique. Um, this is about research methods. So yeah, it's, it's all the stuff from using narrative research through to structural equation modeling and everything in between. Um, grounded theory, the whole bloody lot. Yeah, and, and, and really, yeah, the, the easiest way to do this would be to just do um, some videos or whatever and just, just talk to it. But um, what I've done is uh, I've provided lots of readings. Um, I've, I've broken it up into topics, lots of readings, lots of material for them so the content's not an issue. Um, and, and in fact, with research methods, it's really quite easy because I get them to identify, um, you know, one or more research interests that they have, and then they use that for their context. So that everything that they do, um, I get them to early up front to determine a kind of research problem and a kind of area that they might be interested in researching, uh, maybe get to research questions if, if they're able to, but just a research problem area. And then when we work through the different methodologies, they apply those to their particular interest. And uh, some, if they want to, they can change that throughout the, uh, throughout the course. Um, so the, the context is theirs um, and the material is available. And then our sessions become um, more about me asking them, um, th them asking questions and about, about application. And the assessment's negotiable around their own, um, their own, their own project. Um, there is a, a set assignment that somebody else that was mandatory for the course, which the third assignment was a, um, is a, um, a project proposal. Well, some of them have already done that. So we negotiate their final project, um, their final assignment for, for the course, um, because some of them have already done their project proposal for their PhD or their master's. Um, so that's negotiable too. And, and so the, the whole course is, in, is either, or the other part of it is um, very much a flipped classroom technique. So when we do the webinars, they're all flipped classroom um, uh, where the, the learners come in and, and they're given stuff that they've got to present. Um, and they have to do a written summary of that as well um, around question and answers as well. Yeah. So, and I think, yeah. I think a lot of it is also the, we, we've sort of discussed the idea of an ecology of resources and authentic learning and choosing appropriate tools for what yep. you're trying, you know, uh, what you know, the learning environment you're trying to achieve is. And it comes down to things like, okay, if it's research methods, then um, why are you using PowerPoint? PowerPoint is not a research tool you should be using, you know, a, a research type of tool, whether that's a, a search of databases, um, yeah. whether that's uh, EndNote or Mendeley or whatever, those are the tools that you should be using authentically, not PowerPoint. PowerPoint yes. doesn't come into research. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, that, well, that, that's right. Yeah. So it's, it's actually with research methods, it's not that difficult, and particularly with that level of, of learner. Although some of them are from overseas and, and they kind of have this problem where um, they don't want to... Um, they want to be told. They, they yeah, yes. Yeah, people are so pacified. Yeah. Can I just pick pick up on that? I do um, 
if I could just get a question now, though, there's a question from Pauline on the, the chat there, but I, I was really taken by one of the points on the slide, Stuart, about ambiguity and sort of sitting with uncertainty or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the four questions are on the Google Doc. The first two are about scale. The, the third one's about transition and the fourth one's about heterogeneity or, or variation. But the transition, it's, it's actually a double transition, isn't it? Because what, what I read in your articles and what we've been discussing today is that, that, that children start off naturally curious, they're natural hoitagogists. And then at some point, the discussion here this morning at the breakfast table was, well, where does that go? Well, they get it bashed out of them. Where do, where does it get bashed out of them? In school. I thought it was in primary school, but you say it sort of starts to go wrong in high school. So they've got to come back, don't, don't, don't they? The transition yeah. is not, they don't naturally, and I'm I, 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 I just desperate to get this expression out from Brides of Christ, the TV show of many, many years ago. I don't want to be, I don't want to learn how to think. I just want to be told what to do. So I've had, the I've sort of had that, yeah. had that in yeah. my class. Yeah, that, that <laughs> I use that all the time. Yeah, it's it's just <laughs> so what what I, I guess my question is what yeah what goes wrong and is it that fear thing? Is it that people can't that as people it's so, supposedly ma maturity, but we can't tolerate uncertainty or ambiguity or being left to our own devices? That sort of somehow disappears. I tell you, you I, I, I love what you, I love, I love what you've said because it, it goes to the heart of, uh, heart of the whole thing, and that is that if you if you get a bunch of people like I did with you and said, listen, if you were going to learn a new skill, I've done this in lectures and mm. whatever, you know, big uh, presentations rather, where I've said, done the same exercise, people will quite freely tell you about how they can actually, how they've learned how to be a painter or a, mm. um, how to fix their bloody car or how to do this and how to do that. People will tell you all this sort of stuff. And these are, these are teachers and, and lecturers. And I say, well, why is that not good enough for your students? Mm. You know, they know, you know how to do it. What happens yeah. at high school, I think, is that, um, yeah, it becomes more regimented and more, the, career, the curriculum and the content takes control, uh, particularly here in Australia yeah. and, and in England, where because the, everything's so content driven. So the curriculum takes control. So the curriculum becomes everything, the process. The content becomes the yeah, process. Yeah, and the focus becomes on measuring. How do yeah. you measure learning? Oh, well, that's the other thing, you know? yeah, the, the <coughs> idea of metrics. And, yeah, metrics, yeah. yeah. But, Standardised but, comparisons, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think that idea that the content becomes the process is, is and that's what happens with a PowerPoint presentation. The content becomes a process. Uh, and I think that's what we've got to get away from. And, and, and then, but yeah. I think, I think, you know, people can come along and we, we kind of go, oh, they're very passive learners go and, and say, oh, I can't, you know, why can't you just tell me the answers? And I say, well, and I actually go through the exercise and say, well, how do you, how did yeah. you learn how to, you know, do this? Yeah. And they'll tell you. And I say, well, this is the same. Yeah. You just got to, it's about the confidence, you know, kind mm -hmm. of thing. So, yeah, no, I think everybody can do it. It's just that we get socialized out of it. I mean, the transition should be, back should be occurring at, at university or post-school education, on them, but, but it doesn't. Yeah, like when universities are, I totally agree, universities even worse than, than, than high school, especially to your coursework oh. masters, which is the main domain. Yeah. And I in one of your tables, you had, yeah, research, or you much more suited to research high degree or students where they've got project work. But yeah, the, the, the sort of heavily coursework laden masters degrees that yeah. I imagine all of us teach, but certainly I'm in population health. So Master of Population Health has, yeah. you know, hundreds, five or 600 students or something like that. And that, that's supposedly, po well, it is postgraduate, but it still has the sort of, very much the formats of an undergraduate, yeah, good, mm. sort of the didactic degree. Anyway, thank you. That's, that's terrific. No, that's to, right. No, I love what you okay. said. I, that really galvanised something for me too. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah. That's the first time I've ever said that, that when you get a PowerPoint presentation, the content becomes processed. It's, I've, I've only yeah. just realised it. And so it's... A, that, that could be a great paper for somebody to write if well, they'd like to. It's, it's, it's really easy to kick the shit, shit out of PowerPoint. I enjoyed that, David Phillips. Tom, did you put that up on the, the Flipboard thing? Who, who I put can't that there? remember. Uh, it's the oh, one, it's the, the death by PowerPoint. Yeah, the, yes, it's, a yes, yes, it's a TEDx yes. thing, the death yeah. by PowerPoint. That's, yeah. That was a cracker. That was, yeah, that was, that was gold. Yeah. Every, everyone gonna, should watch that. I'm going to have to go in five minutes, Tom. <laughs> no, we're, we're pretty much winding up now anyway. Um, is there any burning question that anyone wants to ask of Stuart before um, he yeah, heads right. off? I'll take that as a no. 
Well, I was just going to say, what are the <laughs> top three? If you had a frequently asked questions about, or God, you've dealt with the, are you throwing the curriculum out scale? There, there must be sort of half a dozen things. And so, uh, have, have oh. you feel you've covered them all today, or is there is there there's still are we missing an obvious criticism? Because we don't want to go away without the sort of five reasons why <laughs> <laughs> why we should just be told what to do. Um, well, yeah, they're, they're mainly the, that's a good question. Uh, most of the queries I get when I because I can't help it being a shrink that I've got to analyze you know what they're actually saying, but it's yeah. usually about power. It's usually about control. If I, I don't tell them I agree. Right, yeah. That's correct. That's your concept of self that's, that's being is. being challenged. Yeah. Yeah. If I don't if I don't tell the students, they they'll never know. And, and of course know. the truth is that's that correct. you know, if you talk to people for an hour, they won't remember eighty yeah. percent of what you told them a day mm. later. I mean mm. It's such nonsense, but it's about power and control. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it was you who said something about um, ambiguity and uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. Humans, yeah, humans don't like uncertainty and ambiguity. We, we, we naturally do not. Some like it more than others, but it's one of our psychological needs, which is certainty. But, and we like uncertainty, but we only like uncertainty that we can manage. Yeah. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. So, and, and, and people don't well, like uncertainty critique. that we can manage. That that's called sport. Sport. A big thing with sport in games is that it's that it's a yeah, controlled yeah. environment. That that's yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a good one. And and yeah, so we yeah, we don't naturally like that. So when you get a bunch of, you know, so it's personality driven too. That's the other thing is I noticed that a lot of the criticisms I get are from people who have got O C D tendencies or or they they kind of like to control things. They like you know like their ducks lined up, and they can't bear it if you know things are a bit out of kilter. Um, so personality based, I find those people find it harder to transition right. to a hitchcock than people who are a bit like me, where you know I'm I'm an absolute bloody mess. You know I'm I'm chaotic. Um, and, and there's an interesting observation I think, particularly Fred Garner's has kind of made, is that uh, a lot of people who naturally levitate towards you know uh, gravitate towards uh, hortigoji have a you know, creative arts background or or have been <laughs> yeah. musicians uh yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. not necessarily but uh you know uh, it does yeah. seem to 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 align that's why i think yeah. um primary school teachers don't don't have so much of a problem with it the, the, all the primary school teachers i've talked about um they go oh yeah 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 well we do that and, and mm. often they do you know they, they're letting the kids run right to, to a certain degree well right <laughs> they're letting them to mm. explore and do all that kind of stuff they kind of get it um but when you get to high school you, you're school, dealing with yeah. a different type of teacher you know somebody who's got a subject material yeah then again not into process they're into content yeah that, that's a really positive note actually because i yeah i would have thought primary school was pretty re regimented but you're no. saying that to a high school yeah and maybe that's because a lot of the high school teachers would yeah be content specialists and have a have an interest yeah in driving the content forward and maybe high school's not the right environment for that so well well yeah but well i think and i think it certainly it certainly could become and some high schools are doing it and and, mm. they're it. and of course um montessori and, and then of course yeah. um what's the other one um uh, Steiner. yeah 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 steiner schools yeah. i mean steiner, steiner is a lovely yeah. example i mean steiner mm. was doing it before we even started talking about it um, yeah, yeah. These are ideas that are 100 years old, aren't they? And the, yeah. the free classroom stuff. I'll leave you, I'll leave you with a quote okay. from, the great, from the great Fred Emery. Um, Fred, Fred was a psychologist, social psychologist, and uh, very famous. He, he was the guy that designed uh, self-managing teams. Um, he was the guy responsible for those, and systems thinker. But he once said in 1974, he said, um, school pokes your eye, eyes out, um, high, um, university teaches you braille, and postgraduate education at university is speed reading in Braille. Right. Uh, but Fred had a particular axe to grind with universities, but uh, I always like that kind of quote. Uh, I think it's probably a little bit unfair on universities, but. Uh, mm. but okay, well, with that, yeah. we'll say thank you very much. Thanks Stuart. a lot, Stuart. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. No, and, no drama. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I think, you know, if you follow Stuart on Twitter uh, and, or, or, you know, Tweet him with his username. It's, it's a pretty obvious one, at Stuart Hayes. Um, <laughs> then uh, I'm sure that he, uh, he might get around to replying or sending you something. Um, so thank you very much. Awesome. We're next week, we're into week nine, which is effectively pretty much time for preparing your assignment too, which is your proposal outline for your uh, course design. Um, I, I think, uh, well, I, I think it would be useful for us to, those who want to, to get together, have a discussion, see what you, where you're at. Um, there won't be anything particular 
um, that we'll be focusing on for next week for our Zoom discussion. But if people are uh, interested in still having a discussion, brainstorming and getting feedback on where they're at, then I'm happy to do that. So over to you guys. Um, shall we have a session next week or not? Yeah, yeah that'd be good. Can you just clarify the time, the timing? Because in the week, it looks like there's a blank week. Is that right? Uh, no, there's actually three weeks uh, where effectively you're working on your assignment three. Yeah. So, but yeah, so the presentation for assignment um, two or whatever it is on. It's week 10, so that's two weeks away. Yeah, but it's got it down as being three weeks away. Oh, I think you're looking at assignment three. Oh, assignment I, three, okay. Yeah. So there's like a three-week gap in between um, assignment two and assignment three or something like that. Let me just go back to sharing the screen, look at the course outline. Yeah, so if you go to modules. So the modules. So we're into week eight, looking at who to guide you. Uh, week nine, you're working on your presentations around your course proposal. Week 10, you're presenting them using Adobe Spark. Okay. Uh, okay. Then there's so, basically three weeks to work on your full okay. implementation, your prototype of your course. So week 10, two weeks away, is your proposal. It's the outline. It's what you're trying to yeah. uh, design. And yeah. then, then week 14 is the presentation of your wireframe, oh, your prototype, okay. actual course. Okay, so we'll, may, may I make a suggestion? And that is under modules, assessment, it says assignment to August 10. Well, that's three weeks away. So assignment two should be changed to August 3, which is two weeks away. And then there would be three weeks to assignment three. Oh, well, there we go. Okay, I've just made some okay. Yeah, I just sort of lost a week. So yeah, I think, I think what I was saying is next week is week nine and we can have a chat and then we're going to present some stuff the following week, which would be August 3. And then there would be three weeks after that to end of the... Oh, yeah, I've, I've jumped a week, haven't I, there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes much more sense. Okay, so that's just a uh, typing error by me, obviously. <clears throat> okay, I'll fix that up. So next week, we could have a chat about um, preparing presentations for the following week. Yes. We, are we going to yeah. get through all of them? It's a 10 minutes times 16. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, that's right, isn't it? We're all each doing ten minutes. So. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I think I initially put the timing based on the fact there was only eleven uh, students enrolled, so we may right. have to push it out to two sessions for yeah all that. That would, that would, that would make sense because now there's uh, theoretically, I think, nineteen or twenty. Although there seems to be about sixteen people active. Yeah, a couple of people. Are... So good point. Yes, yes, we may need actually timetable two sessions for those presentations. Or we'll have lots of coffee. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, everyone. I'll fix up the dates uh, and yeah. look forward to your blog posts uh, during this week because the Great. third blog post is due. Excellent. Okay, dog. Thank thanks. you. See you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.